Okay, let's get started. Uh, there was a question on uh, Piazza about one of the tests for uh, the skip list. Uh, I think the person complaint actually might be correct, so we're going to go double check to make sure the test is, is actually correct. But everything else sh should be working. Um, and uh, Dana is going to set up Autolab either today or tomorrow, so that'll open it up so you can start submitting it and do the, the full range of the tests that we have available as well. Okay? Any questions about the skip list assignment? All right, so remember, I think it's due uh, Thursday next week. Okay? All right, so today now we're going to talk about uh, doing logging and recovery. So for this class and next class, we'll be talking about how do we actually store information on disk for our in-memory database to make sure that when we crash, when we stop the system, we can come back and make sure everything's still there. So today I'll talk, start off talking about the different types of logging schemes that you can have. Uh, and then we'll do sort of a quick crash course of Aries crash recovery, pun intended. Um, so we don't teach Aries in the undergrad course or intro course because uh, it's sort of complicated. And so I'm not going to go really deep into details how Aries works, but I'll go at it at a high level so you can understand the differences that uh, we'll make when we talk about physical logging or logical logging in either silo R or in InfoDB. Okay? All right, so. Uh, so it sort of should be, again, obvious to everyone, everyone here, because you should have the background in introduction to databases, but we're going to use the logging and recovering protocols in our database system to make sure that all the changes that transactions make are always atomic, meaning they either all happen or none of them happen. Uh, they're always durable, so that if you stop the system and come back, you don't lose any changes. And that we're going to show that the database is always going to be in a consistent state. And that sort of uh, you know, falls in line based on atomicity and durability guarantees, right? So we don't want to see torrent transactions. We don't want to see partial updates and things like that. So every recovery protocol, or recovery, recovery algorithms in a database system is going to have two parts. The first part are is all the actions that you're going to execute at runtime while you, pra practice, or, uh, while you execute transactions normally. Uh, it's also the additional steps you're going to do as you run queries to make sure that you can always recover the database if, there, if there's a failure. And then the second part is the things you'll do after a crash, or at least after a restart, to put the database back into the correct state based on the data you were storing in sort of this phase here. So in a in-memory database system, we are, remember we said that the primary storage location of the database is assumed to be in DRAM or in memory. So when we say that we're doing recovery, the things that we'll talk about, it's not always going to be necessarily due to a failure, right? If you stop the system, uh, like to stop the process, stop the database system, and then turn it back on, it has to suck all the data that was out on disk back in, into memory, right? And this is because we're not using MMAP, right? We have to read everything back in. We can't be guaranteed that everything will be in shared memory when we come back online. So in a... Typically what happens in an in-memory database, you have to, t you know, obviously want to tell the database system to go ahead and shut down, and then it'll take a checkpoint or it'll flush all the logs uh, to, to write everything out. And then when you come back, it's just, you know, it's going to be loading the database back in in the same way that it would do, it, the same sort of process it would have if it was trying to re re recover from a failure. Right, so the same mechanism to turn the database on is the same thing we'll use to recover the database after a crash. There's, there's no real dis distinction here. So, there are essentially two types of logging schemes you can have in a database system. Uh, so the first is physical logging, and this is where you're going to record all the low-level physical changes that transactions make to individual records in the log. Um, so an example of this would be like when, uh, if I update a tuple and I modify a value, I want to store my log, what the old value was and the new value was, and I put that in my, my log record. The other type of logging we have is called logical logging, where instead of actually storing the low-level physical changes, we're instead just going to record the high-level operations or the SQL queries that, that we invoked uh, for a transaction to make the changes. Right? So if you have an insert, update, or delete operation, or delete query, you can just store the, the raw SQL in the log, uh, and that's enough information you need to come back after a crash because you know how to re-execute these queries. So in the silo R paper you guys read, um, 
This is again another example where someone, you know, people that do sort of systems literature or systems research versus database research, they call things differently. Uh, so in the side of the R paper, they refer to, refer to this as value logging, and then this I think was operation logging. But again, in, in, in database literature, it's always going to be either physical logging or, or logical logging. So what are some of the trade-offs we can have for these two different logging schemes? Well, with logical logging, uh, the nice thing about it is that you actually you have to store less data than you would normally have to do in physical logging. So let's say I have a database with a million tuples, and I have a single update SQL query that's going to update all one million tuples. In logical logging, the only thing I need to store in the log is just that, that one single SQL query. Whereas in physical logging, I have to store all the, you know, the one million records that got modified uh, from, from that update operation. So with logical logging, you, you, you end up storing less data. Now you may think this is amazing, right? Why would anyone want to do physical logging uh, when logical logging is, is much, much, much faster? Um, and the, the reason why everyone pretty much uses physical logging, not logical logging, is that it's actually really dif difficult to implement recovery with logical logging when we have concurrent transactions. And I'll be more specific, when you have concurrent transactions in a non-deterministic uh, concurrent to a protocol. And I'll show examples of this uh, later on. Right? And the challenge is because when we have concurrent transactions, the database system is interleaving the operations of those transactions in, in any way that it wants. And if you're not recording you know, what wrote to what first, for you have two concurrent queries, when you recover the database, you may not be able to put it back in the exact same state. It may still be a serializable state, or, you know, it still may be consistent and still follow a serializable schedule, but it may not be the same way, uh, it, may, it may not be the same state as it was before the crash. The other downside of logical logging is that it is going to take much longer for us to actually recover the database because we're essentially re-executing all the queries all over again. So let's say my example when I did my one update uh, on, a, on, a, on a million tuples. If that query was really expensive to compute and they say it took you know, one minute to run, when I have to recover the database and I look at my log and I, and I see that you know, there's a single logical record that says here's the update query, I have to run it all over again and it's going you know, to take that same minute. Right? Just because we're in recovery doesn't mean the queries are going to run faster. Where in physical logging, it literally is just you know, sucking the data in out of the log, looking at where it goes and plopping it down as a straight you know, mem copy or a copy to the location where, where, where it should be located. So in general, logical logging will be faster at runtime, but slower at recovery. And physical logging is uh, slower during runtime, but faster in recovery. So let's look at an example of, uh, an, of, of how we can recover a database using logical logging that may actually put us in an in in inconsistent state. So for this, I have two queries, or sorry, two transactions. The first guy wants to do an update on the employees table and wants to increase all, everyone's salary by 10%. And the second one wants to update the employees table and go to my, my single record and set my salary to, to 900. So for this example, we're going to assume the database system's running uh, with read committed isolation level. So it doesn't matter whether we're doing uh, MVCC or, uh, or uh, two-phase locking. The only thing we care about is that we're running with read committed. So when my first transaction starts and it wants to invoke this query, I'm going to write into my logical log the exact copy of the exact string of the SQL query that, that I then invoked. And then once I do that, then I can have my cursor now do the scan on the table and start updating the tuples. So let's say that it gets to the first two guys and then there's a context switch or something, right? there's, a, there's a pause, and now my other transaction starts running. Now he's going to start, up, start off by writing to the, the logical log to say, I'm going to update the police table and set the salary to 900. And again, it's a straight copy of the SQL string uh, that the client sent us. So now he's going to come in, he's going to get to this record here, and he's going to update it to 900. He then commits, the other thread starts running, it's running again, and it comes down to here, and now it's going to update my salary and add the 10% raise. Right? So this is still serializable. This is okay, right? Because this is... Um, we're doing the update for this one before, before this one. So we're still following the serial schedule, uh, serial, serial ordering. But now the problem is, if there's a crash, uh, and I now have to come back and replay my log, if I replay the log in this order, as it's defined in, the, in you know, based on when it was inserted, I'm going to end up with this state here, where I'm going to lose that 10% that, that, that raise for, for this, uh, 
for this last tuple here. And again, that's okay, right? That would still be considered serializable. Um, but as you can see, when we ran the first time, we had this state, and we cover, recovered the database, we come back, we have a different state. So now, if there was another uh, transaction that read this value and gave it to the outside world, when I recover and now some comes reads this again, it's going to get a different value, right? So this is what I mean by having an inconsistent database after a crash. So this is sort of like a, uh, sort of a very small example, but these are the same kind of complications you can have when you have now multiple queries running uh, and you want to do logical logging. Uh, now, if you run in like ser pure serializable mode or uh, serializable isolation <laughs> or snapshot isolation, this problem would not occur because when this thread got to this last guy here, he would see that uh, my other transaction already updated it and the first writer wins, so the other transaction would abort. But there are some other scenarios where I think logical logging could have problems. Um, but I will fully admit that no one has really thought through about whether doing logical logging, logging at sort of the SQL level in an in-memory database is a good idea or not. We'll see how VoltDB does it, but they're doing a different kind of logical logging called command logging, where they're not logging individual SQL queries, but instead they're logging stored procedure invocations. But as far as I know, no in-memory database does w what I'm describing here. Um, and I haven't really you know, read through the literature or thought through whether it's, it's even possible to do this or not. So, um, yeah, and, and we're in invalid state, so that's bad. All right, so now we're going to spend time talking about what pretty much every single disk-based database system does, how they do logging recovery. And again, this will set us up for when we talk about silo R, we'll see all the cases where they'll deviate because you can do certain things or do apply certain optimizations in an in-memory database that you can't necessarily do in a disk-based database system. So the sort of uh, the canonical method for doing logging and recovery in a disk-oriented database is called ARIES. An ARIES stands for the Algorithms for Recovery and Isolation Exploiting Semantics. So this is, like if you take, read like the textbook for, for any, any, any database class, what they're essentially going to be describing to you when, they, when you talk about logging recovery is some variant of ARIES. And pretty much every single database system that does a disk base that does logging recovery is using, is using something that looks a lot like ARIES. So ARIES was invented uh, at IBM Research in the early 1990s by this guy, Mohan, who's now, I think, a, like an IBM fellow. So he's like a very distinguished researcher at IBM. He's an awesome guy. He's super fun. Um, and I'll say one thing about this. When you look in the literature, uh, you know, I didn't have you guys read the ARIES paper that describes all this logging stuff because it's actually, it's a, it's a real chore to read. It's like 70 pages. It's really in-depth, right? Because he's covering all the corner cases you have to care about to make sure that your, your database is always correct. Um, but to be, one thing to be mindful about is there's a bunch of subsequent papers uh, that Mohan then put out that all sort of follow under this ARIES umbrella. Um, so like the key, key value lock, locking that we talked about with indexes a few weeks ago, uh, that comes from a paper called ARIES key value locking, right? Sort of like he, he, he hit a home run with uh, the logging stuff here with ARIES and then he sort of used that moniker with a bunch of different other papers for branding reasons. Um, but when, it, when people say ARIES, you pretty much think about the protocol that I'm going to talk about here. So I'll also say too, even though this paper came out in 92, it's not to say that nobody else was doing logging and recovery before this. Right? There were certainly uh, you know, uh, enterprise ready or enterprise uh, database systems running in production that could do logging recovery. What this paper really does is just sort of lay out in, in excruciating detail exactly how you want to do it. I right? said so before then, no, like everyone sort of could think about how they're doing it, but then he really codified the steps for doing this. So, since now we're going to go back and in, in discuss doing you know, a disk-based database system, we have to put our sort of disk-based database system hat on and now start thinking about buffer pools, where we, we, we got to ignore that before because we were in memory. So for ARIES, uh, we're gonna, assuming we're having a database system that's with a buffer pool manager, that's going to be using the steel no-force buffer pool policy. So as a quick reminder, what's steel mean? Okay, dirty pages from dirty pages that have been modified by uncommitted transactions are allowed to be flushed out of the buffer pool and written to disk. And what does no force mean? Somebody other than Matt? No force means that we don't require a transaction to flush all its dirty pages out the disk when it commits. Right? Because we can well, we do have to require it to flush all its log records, but we don't require it to flush the pages. So, 
the main ideas of Aries that, that, that are relevant for the discussion here is that we're going to be using write-ahead logging to make sure that any changes that we make to a page in, in memory is always, there's always a, a, rec a log record that's stored out on disk before that transaction is allowed to commit. And we're always going to have to write the log record that modified page out to disk first before we can flush that page. Because right? we need to know what actually modified the page when, when we write it out. And in, in our, in our, um, and the way we're going to do uh, recovery is that we're going to repeat the history uh, by replaying the, the, the log record, the log from, from farther back in time going forward. And we're going to redo all the operations from transactions that have committed since the last checkpoint. And then we're going to do undo by going in the other direction and now reversing changes from transactions that, that did not commit before, before the crash. So that means that in order to do these two steps, in our write-ahead log, these records are going to have to have both the, the before image and the after image of every, every, every attribute that's ever modified. Right? You need the before value to undo it and then the new value to redo it. So now at runtime what's going to happen is, again, the, the, any time a transaction modifies the database, you're going to append some log record to, to the tail of the log. And then when a transaction commits, we have to make sure we flush all the, the log records that correspond to that transaction out to disk as well. And this log is going to be done in sequential order, so there may be transaction or maybe log records that get, get appended to the log um, that came before our committing transaction, but that then will also get flushed out to disk as well. Right? So this is this is why we have to do the undo phase to go back and maybe reverse changes of transactions that got flushed out to the lo log but didn't actually really commit. We're also we're not so I'm not going to talk too much about checkpoints here because we'll do a whole lecture on that. On, uh, on Tuesday, but the, the one thing to be mindful about what, what Aries is doing is using fuzzy checkpoints uh, to uh, flush out the, the, all the pages that are in memory out to disk uh, at, at different p uh, periods during execution so that we don't have to replay the entire uh, log when we have to recover. And fuzzy checkpoints means that rather than having a sort of consistent snapshot of the database where we know there's no dirty pages from, from active transactions, it's going to allow transactions to still modify pages while we're still taking the checkpoint. And that means we, the, the checkpoint, the, the database system has got to maintain some extra metadata in this checkpoint to know things like what were all the transactions that were running at the time I was taking my checkpoint, what are all the pages that got modified when I was taking the checkpoint. And then this is going to require you to do on recovery to look at this information and reconcile what actually should be the correct state of the checkpoint when you start, and then you start, even before you can start replaying the log. So again, I don't talk too much about checkpoints here because we'll, we'll focus some more about it on Tuesday, and we'll talk about different ways to do fuzzy checkpoints. Um, but the, the one thing I'll, that I'll say now is that there are some cases where multi-version concurrency control will make it easier for us to take checkpoints because we can use snapshot isolation to be guaranteed that we have a consistent snapshot of the database. We're not going to see any changes from transactions that have not committed yet. Uh, and we'll see again on Tuesday how different database systems, even if they don't do multi-version concurrency control, maybe switch into this special mode whenever they take a checkpoint. All right, so now, the, as I said, the log is essentially this sequentially ordered uh, data structure, this list, uh, that's going to keep track of all the changes that transactions are making. Now, every single log record is always going to be uniquely identified by this thing called the LSN, the log sequence number. And this is essentially the, how the data system is going to determine the serial order of log operations. And this is, it looks a lot like what we talked about in concurrency control, where we're using timestamps to figure out the serial order of, of transactions. Uh, but in this case here, we're, we're maintaining this just for the log. So there will be the transaction IDs that you assign to transactions and a log sequence number that you can assign to uh, individual log records. So now before, I talked about how the log, the generating a transaction ID or transaction timestamp could be a bottleneck. We talked about using, you know, atomic operations or batching or special hardware counters to make these things go faster. Um, it's now even a bigger issue in, in if, you're, if you take Aries and try to use it in an in-memory system because now, you know, say you have a thousand transactions running at the same time, it's not that big of a deal to maybe get a new, new transaction ID for those 1,000 transactions. But if all of those transactions are updating the database and they all make 1,000 updates, now you need to generate a new log sequence number for all those 1,000 updates per 1,000 transactions. Right? So this, this actually can become a bottleneck um, 
in, in, in a multi-core fast system, and you'll see again why the silo guys choose to use those uh, persistent epoch batching technique to avoid, avoid this bottleneck here. So the LSNs that the database system is going to assign for its uh, log records uh, is going to be used all throughout the system to keep track of almost everything that's going on. Or keeping track of what's in memory and what's not, not on disk, and what's dirty and what's clean and things like that. And so every page is going to have its own page LSN that corresponds to the log record of, of that, that made the most recent change to it. The database system is going to keep track of what's the last page or log record that I flushed out the disk. Uh, and then for every page I need to flush out, you need to say, you know, it, it has the log record that modified this uh, page, has that been successfully ri safely written out the disk, right? So there's all these different sort of things we keep, need to keep track of for these LSNs all throughout the system, again, to know when it's safe to write things out. So this is a quick high-level diagram of, of what Aries sort of looks like, and I'm being, this is a gross oversimplification, but for our purposes, it, it's, this is enough. So again, every single uh, log record, in, either whether it's in memory or out on disk, We'll have a unique LSN, and then we'll keep track of inside of any pages we have the LSN that corresponds to the log record that last modified it, and then we'll have the flush LSN that keeps track of like what was the last log record we, we successfully written out. Then there's a master record stored in disk as well, and this corresponds to the last checkpoint that you took. So now, while again, while we're, we're, our transactions are running, we're updating pages, we're pulling things in and out in, into the buffer pool from disk, we have to make sure all these things are correct and all our invariants are satisfied to make sure that we don't write out dirty data when we shouldn't have. Right? And again, I'm, this is super high level what, what Aries is doing. There's a lot more going on, but this is, these are the main things we have to care about. So, uh, yeah, so in, order to, in order to flush a page, I have to go make sure that the page LSN is less than the flush LSN because uh, I don't want to flush a page that has been written out the disk yet. I don't want to flush a page w where the log record that modified it hasn't been written out the disk yet. Right. So I showed you this graph in the beginning of the course uh, where, I, where from the study that they did with the Shore system where they measured how much time the database system was spending in the different components. And remember I talked about how you know, for, for, for the buffer pool manager, that was 30%. For locking, that was 30%. And then for recovery and lo logging and recovery, it was 28%. And now you kind of see why, why this is actually so high, right? This, is, has no, so this measurement here is just based on CPU cycles. So this is not even counting, like, actually flushing out to disk or an SSD. Right? This is literally just all that LSN management stuff that I talked about before. Like keeping track of these log records, checking all these different counters to make sure that, they're, you know, your things are in the right order. And that's why this 20% number comes up. You're doing all this stuff because you will need to make sure that the state of the database on disk corresponds to what the, state of the, the correct state of the database that's in memory. Right? And so when we'll see when we talk about silo R, we can, we're going to reduce this number by not worrying about LSNs or not worrying about individual pages. Right? We're going to worry about things on a, on a per transaction basis. So for the recovery phase, again, real quick what Aries does. Uh, Aries has three phases. Uh, so in the first phase, you have to read the write-ahead log uh, from, from sort of beginning to end. And you want to figure out what are all the dirty pages that are hanging around that were in memory while you were running, what are all the transactions that were active when there was a crash. Uh, and, you, and you sort of uh, you compare this with the, all the, the extra information that's stored in the, in the checkpoint to know what was going on. Then you jump to some point in the log and you start from going from beginning to end and redoing all the transactions. Right? Even for transactions that are eventually going to abort, you redo everything. Then you get to the bottom of the log and then now you go back in the reverse direction and you start undoing all the transactions that you, you didn't see commit. So they don't have a commit record in the log, you know that they didn't actually finish successfully. So in the undo phase, you reverse everything. There's sort of like three passes on, on the log, right? You have to go through once to figure out what's even in there. Then you go jump to some point and start redoing things. And then you go back in the other direction, which is usually the undo part is, is shorter than the redo part. You go back and make sure that you undo changes from transactions that didn't finish. All right? So we're not even going to you know, do comparison on recovery times here. Uh, but this can be pretty expensive. Uh, I don't have exact numbers, but like, you know, if you ever have to restore a very large Postgres MySQL database, uh, it's going to take hours, possibly days. 
right, depending on your hardware and things like that, but it's because it's doing all these, these steps. So that's sort of the high level issue, uh, high level issues that occur in uh, disk based logging recovery. So I want to talk a little bit now, what are some optimizations we can apply to make sort of transaction uh, execution and, and logging go faster in, in, in this kind of system. And what I'll say also too is that the techniques that I'll talk about here are not specific to disk-based systems. We can then also apply them to the in-memory systems that we talk about next. So in the pie chart I showed before, again, that was only measuring CPU cycles. So it wasn't measuring the time it actually takes to flush out data to, to disk, right? And in actuality, that's always the slowest part of, of any database system. Right? Writing out the disk, unless you have a really, really nice device, uh, is always going to be slow. So, and the reason why it's going to be slow is because we have to do an f-sync on the disk controller to make sure that any changes that were in the, sort of the, the disk controller's buffer are then definitely written out to disk. Because again, we don't want to crash and come back and something we told the outside world was safely committed is actually gone. Right? So that's why we do have the f-sync and wait till we get an acknowledgement before we can send it to back, the result back to the client. So one standard technique to speed this up is you use something called group commit. Uh, and so the basic idea here is just you're going to batch together a bunch of the log records that the different transactions generate, whether it's physical logging or logical logging, it doesn't matter. You're going to batch together a bunch of their log records and then you're going to write them out all, all at once and do a single f-sync. And the idea here is like, um, uh, you want to amortize the cost of having to do this f-sync across multiple transactions. So that means like if you're, if you're the first transaction that shows up, you'll wait a little bit longer, but if you're the last transaction that shows up, then it's just the same thing as if you did immediate f-sync. Right? So this sort of evens out the, the average latency of everything. So there's two ways to do this. Uh, the first is like you, you have a buffer and you set the size and when the buffer is full, then you just go do the f-sync right there. Another way is to have a timeout to say like after 5 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, no matter whether uh, my buffer is full or not, then I, I do the f-sync for that. So this technique was originally developed in IBM, IBM's IMS FastPath. And FastPath is sort of like a, um, in the same way that Hecaton was a sort of optimized execution engine for SQL Server, FastPath is like the optimized execution engine for, uh, for IMS. Um, there's not a lot of, there, there's some early literature in the 1980s that discusses what it is, but it's very ar archaic. And then now when you actually try to read what FastPath is, uh, on like IBM's website, it's a bunch of like you know corporate mainframe stuff, and so it's hard to sort of decipher. But the best of my knowledge, it's basically like an in-memory engine, in-memory execution engine for for IMS. Uh, and so now, obviously, this seems like an obvious thing. Of course, you want to batch together your transactions, and pretty much everyone everyone does this. But maybe you know in, in the 19, 1980s, this was considered uh, a, a, a breakthrough idea. The other technique that we can apply optimiz optimization we can apply is do early lock release. And the idea to think about this is, technically, when a transaction tells you I want to commit, it hasn't really truly committed until you know that the log records are flushed to disk. And so under proper you know, concurrence to a protocol, that means that you have to hold all the locks for transactions while they're sitting in the queue waiting to get flushed out to disk. Right? But when we think about it, that's kind of unnecessary, right? Because you're just going to assume that it's going to be, you know, most of the time it's going to be able to write out the disk successfully. So when on the early lock release, you can give up your locks while you're waiting in the queue to get flushed out to hand them off to other transactions and let them continue to run because otherwise they just block and waiting, waiting for your f-sync. Now, this obviously is, would be bad if, if you have a read-only transaction that came behind another, a writing transaction that was waiting to get flushed and it read its, its changes, and it wasn't running under you know, read uncommitted isolation, and then it read its, its changes and then you know, send out the data to the outside world before that flush happened, and then the flush fails, and then now we have, you know, we had, we had data leak that shouldn't have occurred. So the database system has got to maintain some extra metadata to know that the transaction that is being waited, that the, the transaction that you're waiting to flush it releases its locks, and any transaction that comes along that reads the data that 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 waiting transaction has modified, it has to wait to know that that transaction has successfully flushed before it can it also can commit. So there's certain some dependency information you have to maintain about you know, who's waiting on what and what locks you're allowed to get in order to make this thing work, right? But again, this this is sort of a no-brainer idea. This is what a, a lot of systems do, right? You sort of spec you speculatively assume commits are going to succeed, and so for you release your locks early. 
And again, there's nothing about what I'm describing here is specific to a disk-based system or even uh, two-phase locking. You can do this in some of the timestamp ordering schemes that we talked about before. Okay, so any questions about disk recovery, any questions about Ares or any of this before we start switch, switch over to the in-memory stuff? And again, the pretty much every single database system out there is using some variant of Ares. They may not call it Ares and may be slightly different, but at the high level, all these protocols are essentially the same. All right, so now with the in-memory system, uh, one of the nice things about this is that logging recovery is actually easier for us in some ways, right? Because now we don't have to worry about tracking dirty pages in our buffer pool, right? We don't have to make sure, we, ha we don't have to worry about when I load my database ba back up and I read my last checkpoint, are there a bunch of changes that I shouldn't have been allowed to see? Um, and this is because, and so because of this, we don't have to worry about now storing undo records in our logs. The log records, if you're using physical logging, only need to record the, the new values or, or the after images. It just doesn't need to perform, doesn't need to store the before images because we never have to undo. Once, we, once our transaction commits and we know it's been flush, flushed out the disk, then we never have to reverse it. We may want to replay it if we have to re recover after a crash, but we never have to unroll it or undo it. So that's not, also, that's not to say that we're not going to maintain undo information in memory. Right, because if we have our transaction that gets aborted because of a conflict, we obviously need to roll back any of these changes. But what I'm saying is, again, after you do your commit and you're flushed to disk, you just blow away all that undo, undo stuff. So, our system is still always going to be uh, slowed down, though, by the slow sync time of non-volatile storage, right, the disk storage. So even though we have a you know, fast in-memory database system, we're, we're always going to be slowed down by the slowest, slowest device, which is always going to be disk. So, one thing I'll point out though, and when you read some of the early papers from the 1980s, 1990s on logging and recovery from some of the early in-memory database systems, they always make this sort of statement in about like, oh, well, you know, non-volatile memory is going to come out pretty soon and we think we can use that and, and that'll speed things up. We don't, you know, our in-memory database will, will be super, super fast. So, of course, obviously, like, you know, these are written in the 1980s and they always say, you know, it's going to be in five years and then 30 years later, we still don't have these devices. Um, so, in the, all the protocols that we'll talk about here, we'll assume that we don't have non-volatile memory, um, and then we want to talk about how we build protocols that run on SSDs and HDDs. So I'll talk later in the semester about some of the research we've been doing for non-volatile memory. Um, I would say that, like, you know, so this paper is from 1987, it says, like, yeah, we'll, we'll have, you know, non-volatile memory pretty soon. Um, and maybe these, er these early systems, they were maybe talking about having, you know, regular DRAM that had a battery backup or like a supercapacitor so that like, you know, if the power gets pulled, it has enough charge actually to flush everything out to some kind of stable storage. Um, you can buy that hardware today. It's not cheap uh, and it's certainly not commodity hardware, right? Like you can't go to Amazon and go on EC2 and get an instance that has non-volatile memory. Um, so the newer technologies that are coming out, uh, they're actually be true non-volatile memory. So it's not DRAM plus, plus a battery. It's actually sort of special materials that can actually store data, like DRAM, like at a byte at a, a byte granularity. But when you pull the power, and everything is still still durable. So again, I'll talk. I'll give a whole lecture about this later in the semester. Uh, I'll just say that like when I gave this talk last year, I said like, oh well, you know, I think I think I think non volatile memory will be out in five years. Uh, so now it's a year later. I still think it's four years. Um, although Intel claims they're going to have something out. Um, later this year, but it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be like a, like a DRAM for replacement. It's going to be like a fast SSD that goes for the PCI Express. Again, I'll talk more about non-volatile memory and how the implications of it, but I would say that, again, I still stand by my statement. It's probably four years away before you, you get something that can replace DRAM and be non-volatile. And then in the lecture, we'll talk about what do you need to change in the database system to, to make use of this. Okay, so uh, the paper that you guys read was the, the logging recovery version of Silo, and they called Silo R. And you guys read the Silo concurrency control paper early in, 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 the, in the semester, and part of the reason I had you read that paper instead of the Hecaton concurrency control paper is, is that it makes it easier to understand how they're going to do recovery. So you don't have to, you know, you can understand how they're doing this epoch-based OCC, and you can see how that's going to fit in with, with, with this logging scheme. So the key idea that they're going to do here is that they want to do high-performance logging by parallelizing the, 
the log records or, or the, the different logs they have to maintain. So, as we'll see in a second, every CPU socket is going to have its own dedicated uh, physical device to store, to store data. Um, and so that means there's essentially going to be multiple log files being generated at the same time. And they have to do some extra work to make sure that they can coalesce these things on recovery and make sure they always put the database in the correct state. But whereas in the Aries example I was showing before, that was assuming that was, there was a single log file that all the different threads were, were appending to. And so again, I love this paper because I think Eddie Kohler is one of the best systems researchers out there now. Right? And, and Silo Arts is a well, well written and really lays out all the key, key ideas very, 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 uh, very well. All right, so the logging protocol for Silo is that, again, the database system is going to assume that there's going to be a single storage device that's dedicated per CPU socket. And it's going to, ha it's going to have one thread in, in that CPU be allocated as, as the logger thread. And that thread is going to be responsible for writing all the log records out, out to this device. And all of the other cores will be used for these worker threads uh, that are going that are to be responsible for executing transactions. So what happens is when a worker thread wants to execute a transaction, uh, it's going to create all these new log records in a buffer, and then it's going to hand that buffer off to the, the logger thread to write it out. So and again, because we're in memory database system, we don't have to record any undo information in our log. We only have to record the redo information, because that's enough for us to, re to restore the database back to the correct state. So now, in the logger thread, it's going to maintain this pool of log buffers that it's going to hand out as needed to the different worker threads. And then when the worker thread's log buffer is full, it then hands that buffer off to the logger thread, which then queues it up to write it out. And I'll use group commit to batch a bunch of these buffers together and write them, in the, write them out all at once and do a single f-sync. So the key thing, though, is the way that they're going to support, um, avoid having to overload the system, is that the number of log buffers they have in the pool is finite. So if, if a worker thread you know, gives back a full log buffer and then asks for another one, if there's not another one available, then they have to stall and wait. And the idea here is that, that you don't want the uh, you don't want the transact the worker threads to get too far ahead of executing too many transactions, and the the, the logger threads can't keep up by running it out fast enough. Right, so this sort of acts as a built-in governor to make sure that you don't overload the system and provide proper back pressure to make sure that you know, things sort of are are smoothed out nicely. So avoid sort of burstiness of like all these transactions committing all at once and then stalling for a while, then committing all again. Okay, so in the log file, the logger, thread, logger threads are going to can append to a single file all these different records. And in each record, you have to maintain the, the, the ID of the transaction that modified it, and then a triplet that corresponds to the, the table that was modified, and then a key and a value. And the value could be sort of a, you know, a, a single entry, a single you know, scalar value, or it could also be an attribute list where of the individual attributes that were modified. So this is sort of like the, the delta encoding scheme that we talked about for MVCC, where instead of storing the entire tuple, uh, you only need to store what, whatever the individual attributes that were modified. And then what's going to happen is the logger thread is going to keep appending to this file, uh, and, then, uh, and then when it gets to about 100 epochs, then it's going to switch, rename that file, and then create a new one. And the idea here, it makes it easier to do disk management now because you're going to have all these individual log files uh, that you can then clean up and throw away if you know that you don't need them anymore. Right? Sort of a way for you as the administrator to be e easier to manage this thing. Right? Rather than having this giant single log file, which you always have to keep around, if you break it up into smaller chunks, then you can throw away older files more easily. And this is not a novel idea to, to silo. Right? E pretty much every single database system does this. So this is, this is a, a screenshot of a, a, a MySQL installation that I help manage. And what you see here is that there's two files called IB log file, IB log file zil, IB log file one. So this is the same log file that, that the silo R is also maintaining, right? Every single time you make a new file, you rename the old one and, and create the new one, right? And that means that I know that if I, if, if I don't need to you know, keep track of my old history of my log records, I can just come by and blow this file, blow this file away easily without worrying about corrupting this one, right? Again, this is not fundamental to the protocol, it sort of makes it easier to manage these installations. All right, so let's see, they have an example like this. Uh, so this is an uh, example of what the log record format is going to look like. So I'm going to do a single query, I want to update uh, the people table, and I'm going to set the islam flag for Dana myself. So in this log entry here, you would have the transaction ID that, got, that modified it, what table it modified, and then the key for the value, and then the update to the, uh, 
to the attribute. So one key difference here, again, from what Aries did, is that there's no log sequence number. We're actually now using the transaction IDs to figure out the serial order of these log records. And that's enough to guarantee that when we, when we restore the database, we're always going to go back in a consistent, correct state. Right? Now in the case of OCC, uh, because Tyler is using OCC, recall that you don't actually get a transaction ID until your, uh, until your transaction finishes the validation phase. So we'll be appending these log records during the read phase of a transaction as we're actually modifying things. And then for that, for, you know, since we don't have, actually have a real transaction ID, we just put a little placeholder in and then it knows how to come back and fill that in and replace and, uh, and, and, and um, change that to be the correct one when the transaction actually truly does commit. Yes? Can you explain why you can uh, deal with the interleaving operations for the concurrent transactions? So your question is why can... Um, your question is, why does this logging scheme allow for interleaving of concurrent operations? Like the example. Yeah, so your question is, why, why does this scheme allow for concurrent interleaving of, or, or interleaving of operations from multiple transactions and still guarantee the transaction ends up in a correct state? Yeah. Because the transaction ID corresponds to the serial order of, of operations. So even though I may have log records appear in different orders, Right, there may be a log record here for like transaction you know, 9999 that comes after this one. When I do my recovery phase, uh, I know that this thing should come before that thing in, in the real serial order. So physically on the log, the order might be switched, but logically the transaction ID tells me what the order should be. Sorry, say it again? So let's say there are two transactions, and transaction uh, execute the op uh, operation one, and transaction two uh, execute the uh, operation two, and then uh, the thread switch back to uh, transaction one, and transaction one execute the operation three. So these three operations both has transaction ID attached in the log, right? Yeah. So 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 again, every log record has to have a transaction ID. And that's unique to whatever the transaction that, that, that made this change. And this transaction ID is always increasing in, in monotonic, is always increasing in order. So in that time, you need to determine the serial order of transactions. So it doesn't matter that when I ran it the first time, uh, the interleaving might, have, you know, might be different. The, the transaction ID will guarantee that I know the, what the, be the true serial order of these things. So when I recover, I'm always going to be in the correct state because I go by these IDs. Right, and again, it's, it's um, the fact that we're doing these persistent epoch batches also makes this a little bit easier because within a persistent epoch, within an epoch, you know how to generate the order of these things. So it's not, so it's, it's, there's enough information around in the log for you to reason about what the correct state should be when you come back. And these transaction IDs tell you what that order should be. Okay? All right, so let's look at a high-level example of what's going on. So we have our in-memory database, we have our worker thread, we have our logger thread, uh, and it has, a, it has a, its free buffer pool, and then its, its list of buffers that it wants to flush. And then we'll assume that this is running on a single socket, so there's one storage device with one you know, series of log files that we're maintaining for our transactions. Then we also have our persistent, or sorry, epoch thread that's responsible for updating the epoch every uh, 40 or 50 milliseconds. Right, and it doesn't matter what thread this is on, right, in, in our socket, right, because it doesn't have to run that often. It runs every, you know, yeah, periodically. So let's say that our transaction, if we, the client invokes a transaction, and we want to start running on this worker thread. So remember that in, in Silo, they talk about using a one-shot API, which is just another word for doing store procedures. So this is sort of a self-contained sort of, sort of procedure call, a function, that has program logic intermixed, intermixed with, with, with SQL queries. This is running all in one place on, on the worker thread. So the transaction is going to start, and so it wants to start updating the, the database, so we have to go to our logger thread and say, give me a free log, free log buffer. And then once we got that, then the transaction can start running and can start making modifications to the database, and we'll append these entries to the log record. 
Now let's say that before this transaction commits, it makes so many changes that it actually can't, you know, it fills up the log buffer. Uh, so what we'd actually do is to go back to the logger thread and say, this thing's full, go ahead and flush it, even though my transaction hasn't committed yet. Um, and then it can ask for the next one, the next free buffer. Same thing, let's say that it, it writes a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff to this and it fills up. Um, and it, it, uh, let me start over. So um, it's writing all those changes, but then the, the epoch thread updates to a new persistent epoch, and that requires the thread to say, all right, whatever I have going on, now I, I need to go ahead and write this out. Because what we want to happen is anytime we change the epoch, any out, outstanding log buffers have to be written, written out. And you don't start it, another round of transactions until you know everything is durable in the, before you start the next epoch. So in this case here, if this guy starts running again, uh, it can't because it's not going to be able to get another log buffer, so it has to stall and wait. And in the meantime, the logger thread will flush, flush these things out. And once we know these are durable, then these log, these log buffers go back into the free pool, and then this guy can get one and keep running again. And again, the, the, the fact that we're maintaining a finite memory pool for the, the log buffers prevents us from overwhelming the, the system by running too many transactions. Um, and, and we can't write them out fast, fast enough. So I think in the side of the paper they talk about this being like a 10% of the total memory size. Yes? Um, but but does he, if the worker thread gives, gives a buffer to the logger for, to flush before it's finished committing, doesn't that, doesn't that violate the, I guess the, the rule that we don't have to undo? Yeah, so his statement is, if I'm here, uh, actually here, if I give, if, I, if, if this, sorry, it's here. It, when I hand off this log buffer, and I tell it, go ahead and write this out, but the epoch hasn't finished yet, or the transaction hasn't finished yet, would that violate our guarantee that we don't have to worry about writing dirty pages, right? And the answer is no, because we'll see in a second, because we're going to have to maintain a separate log file to keep track of what is the, what is the persistent epoch. What is the sort of high watermark to know that any transaction prior to this epoch has been safely committed. So we haven't written that out yet, so we know that this, this is still fine to do. So we would come back and know that, yes, we see some log entries for a, an epoch, but that epoch shouldn't have committed yet. Right? There, think of this, they're doing everything in batches. So once I know my batch of transactions have been flushed at every single log record, or every single log device, then technically all those things are, are then committed. Sort of like a super uh, group commit across multiple sockets. Uh, yeah, so this excellent segue. So, um, okay, as, as Matt sort of pointed out, the logger thread can write out things uh, incrementally over time, but a transaction truly is not committed until we, we, we flush out the persistent epoch entry. Um, and you, you can think of this as like, it's a separate log file. We're going to keep track of the current epoch, the, the highest epoch that's been successfully written out the disk from all our... Uh, logger threads. And so what we'll say is that a transaction that executed in epoch E can only be truly committed and have the results released back to the application once you know the persistent epoch for E is actually safe to the special log device. So way to think about it like this, say now we're, we're going to run on multiple sockets, we have say three CPU sockets, and each socket is going to have its own logger thread which writes out to its own dedicated storage device which in, then you know, maintains multiple log files. Um, and then we'll have a bunch of worker threads that correspond to it. But then there'll be a special thread, a special logger thread that's the persistent epoch thread. And this guy is responsible for knowing, uh, maintaining this special persistent epoch file on any device, it doesn't matter which one it is. And then when, it, when, when transactions, or so when logger threads actually commit and flush uh, an epoch, it needs to know, once, once it gets a response or acknowledgement from all threads that they have successfully flushed it out 200, then it also then goes and writes 200 to this. And therefore the system knows that all the, everything that came, came before this has, has successfully finished. So, so the idea is like, this guy's written out 200, this guy's written out 200, this guy's written 200. So I update 200 here. So when I come back, I look into this and say, anything that comes after 200 has not committed. So even though the logger thread may have flushed out something at 201, uh, it's not going to get recovered because it didn't, you know, didn't correspond, you know, it wasn't part of this batch that got f successfully written out. 
So last year we sat and had a discussion about do you actually need this? Do you actually need this to have the separate log file? And the answer is actually no. Um, this is only being done for convenience reasons. Uh, that there's a single location you look on recovery to figure out what the persistent epoch is. But all these different logger threads are essentially recording this information already. So on recovery, what you could do is you could go to the end of every single log file and figure out what is the max persistent epoch that was successfully written by all the logger threads. And that's essentially the same thing as this. So you don't need this, you don't need this for correctness to re restore the database state. They just do this for software engineering reasons because it makes it easier. And again, you're writing out you know, a, a small you know, eight, eight, eight byte persistent epoch number every 50 milliseconds. So it's not, it's not that big, big of an overhead. But from a correctness point of view, in the case again, the, map, the example that Matt brought up, say my log buffer gets full in this top guy here and we write out something at like 201 uh, for, and the transaction hasn't committed yet, but when I crash and I come back, I see these guys only wrote out 200 and this guy wrote out 201, so I can't allow 201 to be successfully restored because all these other ones didn't, didn't get to 201. How can one be 201? Isn't the above consistent across? Right, so her statement is how can, how can one be 201 and the other one still be behind 200? So I would say when I say 201, like they wrote 201, right? These other ones were going to, they just didn't get to it yet. So therefore, and again, you don't release the acknowledgement, you don't, you don't acknowledge to the client that the, app, the, the transactions have committed until you know that all these guys have flushed the, the, the epoch. Right, this is different than in Aries. In Aries, you're flushing individual transactions, or you're, you're, you're re returning acknowledgements to the client for individual transactions based on knowing that their log, their, their log records have successfully written out. In this case, because they want to avoid the log sequence numbers, because that's going to be a bottleneck in a really fast system, they sort of, again, do these things in batches. Because then you only have to coordinate across all different sockets uh, every 40, 50 milliseconds. All right, so now let's talk about how to do recovery from this. So in the first phase, you're just going to load the last checkpoint that you took. And again, we'll talk more about what checkpoints look like next class. Um, the one thing I want to point out, though, is in silo, and pretty much every in-memory database that I'm aware of, you always have to rebuild the indexes when you turn the database back on. So what I mean by that is there's, the database system is not going to log any changes you make to indexes. So when the system crashes, all that information gets blown away. And then when you come back, you load the last checkpoint. Because you're essentially doing a sequential scan on the checkpoint to, to reload the database, that's when you re rebuild your indexes. Right? And this is not that big of a deal because, as you'll see in your skip list, when you start really, you know, sort of hammering it, you can build an index pretty quickly, right? You can process, you know, a couple million keys and insert a couple million keys a second. So that's pretty fast. So they, they're willing to pay the penalty to rebuild the index on recovery to avoid having to log information about what, the in, what changes get made to index at, at runtime. So again, so far as I know, every in-memory database makes, makes this choice. Right, so now once we load our checkpoint, now we're going to replay our log. And then the difference, though, of what we're going to do here versus what Aries did is that we only have to make a single pass to the log. And we're actually going to go in reverse order. We're going to start from the end of the log and go, go backwards in time. Where in Aries, and when you do the redo, you start at back in time and you go forward in time. All right, so what will happen is our system starts up. And we're going to go check our persistent epoch file to see what's the, the highest persistent epoch that was successfully flushed by all our devices. Right? And again, any log record that comes after this is ignored. Right? Because it didn't actually truly commit. So then we'll go now in, in, at, at the tail of the log and we'll go back and for every single log record we'll apply that change to the database. Again, they're doing physical logging, they're doing value logging, so you just the exact value or the data that you want to put for a single tuple will be exactly in the log record. You just do a straight copy into the database. Right? We don't have to re-execute any query. Now what will happen is because we're going in reverse order, the, uh, the thread needs to check to see whether the tuple already exists. Right? So if it doesn't exist, then you're going to go ahead and create it because that's the same thing as, as inserting. Um, then if it, if it does exist, then you need to check to see whether the transaction ID 
of the log record that last modified it is newer than the trans than log record I'm trying to apply to it. So what I mean by that is, um, it's because we're going in reverse order. That means that whatever I see at the bottom for a tuple is what the last value it should be. And I can ignore anything that comes after it. Right? Again, the difference is if you go in, in forward direction, then you would, you know, if I update tuple 1, I would do my first update, and then later on in the log file, I would do another update, because I need to make sure that's the newer value. But because they go in reverse order, they know that whatever the last, whatever the first entry they see as they go back in time should be the, the recent version of the tuple. So this also speeds up recovery as well, because you can't do this in, in Aries. You have to apply all the changes, and then you go back and undo the ones that shouldn't be there. In their case, because they know that anything they read after this that comes before this persistent epoch is successfully committed, then they know that it's grabbed the recent version. So this is another example of what you can do to speed things up if you're in an in-memory database that you can't do in a disk-based database system. All right, so let's get in real high level what recovery looks like. Right, so then we have our special persistent epoch thread. It's always going to read in the persistent epoch file what the current one is. And then we're going to have a bunch of these recovery threads because uh, we haven't, can't start processing transactions because we're still doing recovery. And it's going to tell them, here's the persistent epoch you, sh you, sh you, should, you should follow. They all then first load in the checkpoint, th the last checkpoint you took, restore the state of the database, and then they look at the log files and go in reverse order and apply all these changes. And then once all these guys are done, you kill all these recovery threads, and then you start up the logger thread and the, and the worker threads, and you start processing transactions like, like, like normal. Okay? All right, so, um, and I, this is the, the point that he, he brought up before, and I'll sort of say this again. We don't need log sequence numbers because the transaction IDs that we're going to be generating for, for at runtime is going to be enough for, for us to guarantee that we can execute things in serial order. Because right? remember, uh, Silo is doing serializable OCC, so, we're, so these transaction IDs are going to be guaranteed for us that we know the correct serial order. So as long as we put the database back in the, in, in the, same, you know, in the same state based on these transaction IDs, we're going to be consistent from, from crash to crash to crash, or restart from restart. And then we don't need these separate log sequence numbers. Okay? Yes? So why not use uh, transaction ID in the disk-oriented So his question is, why not use transaction IDs in the disk-oriented database? Um, in the case of Ares, uh, Ares assumes that uh, the, it does not assume that you're running a serializable order. So, you, so, you, so that wouldn't guarantee that. Where in this case here, because they're, they're serializable, th you can do that. Do you mean that the transaction ID does not guarantee the serializable order in this oriented database? Your statement is, does, does, does the transaction ID not guarantee that things are in serializable order in a disk-based database system? Uh, no, yeah, that's actually incorrect too, yes. Um, so his question is, why can't you just use a transaction ID in a disk ordinary system to still, to, instead of having to use log sequence numbers? Uh, let me get back to you on that. I, I know this answer, I, I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Okay, that's a good point though. Okay, uh, all right, so, so it, we're running out of time, so I want to go through this quickly. So quick evaluation, they're going to compare Silo uh, against itself, running YCSB and TPCC benchmarks, and they're going to run this on a four-socket machine at MIT. Uh, it's a few years old now, but that's okay. Uh, but it has a quarter terabyte of RAM. Now, this one important thing you may have overlooked when you read the paper is that they're running this system on, we're using three Fusion I.O. cards. Uh, again, this paper, I think, is four or five years ago. Um, so these are not as state as they are they used to be, but at the time these are pretty high-end hardware. Right? Each of these drives is like five thousand so, dollars. So they're basically using you know fifteen thousand dollars of of storage devices to to make the disk latency of doing F-Syncs go away. And because the, the, the box only has three PCIe Express slots, right, so you can only have three cards, and then they have to use a RAID five disk array uh, to sort of match what what these guys can do here. Right now, Fusion I.O. cards, I don't think are, they're as exotic as they used to be. Um, there's a bunch of different sort of manufacturers that will sell you these sort of PCI Express SSDs as well. 
All right, so the first example I want to show is you is, is the difference between silo running without any logging whatsoever and then silo with, with the only logging and then silo with checkpointing. So the way silo does checkpoints, it basically takes checkpoints all the time. And then when it finishes the checkpoints, it waits 10 seconds and then it starts another one up. So these sort of gray, bar, he, gray bars here are when it's taking a checkpoint and then there's a small pause where it, you know, it waits a little bit before it starts taking the, the next one. And so the main thing to point out here is that when you, only, when you don't have any logging, you're running about 10 million, almost 11 million transactions a second. But when you enable logging, uh, you're paying about a, roughly about a 10%, a little bit over 10% overhead, uh, which is actually really good. Because normally, if you have a slower disk device, the, the flushing is, is always going to be the, the major bottleneck. All right, and then now if you just account for the CPUs, as I showed in the pie chart at the beginning, that was 28% of your overhead. But now here they're showing you that you're only paying a 10% overhead to do complete logging and checkpoint, and that includes flushing out the disk. Right? So that's, that's pretty significant. That's a big deal. So, and then they have numbers for, for doing TPCC, and again, here we're doing logging and checkpoint. Here's only with logging, and then you have without any recovery. And the latency of when you're doing checkpoints is, is slightly higher. And you see in some cases there's little blips in performance here, and this could be due to like the, the SSD doing you know, garbage collection or reorganizing the actual uh, the flash shells. So again, here they're doing almost 600,000 transactions a second on pure memory database, and then it's only paying again about 10% overhead uh, when you're doing logging and checkpoints. So again, we'll talk more about how you do checkpoints next class. Uh, the frequency and you do, how often you do checkpoints depends on you know, how fast you want the system to recover. Uh, so I want to skip this real quickly, but the, the main thing to show here is that they can recover a 200, 200 gigabyte database from a checkpoint and a log in roughly 200 seconds. And that's pretty significant. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that easily. You're not going to get these kind of speeds using, you know, uh, MySQL Oracle. They're definitely much, much, much slower. All right, so, uh, so now I want to jump real quickly and talk about logical logging in VoltDB. So, uh, one observation we can make is that, that the you know, proponents of logical logging will say, well, database failures in a, in sort of a modern setting are actually kind of rare. Right? If, if you're running on a system that, that needs an MRE database and you need to be really fast, well then chances are you probably have money to have a bunch of backups, a bunch of replicas. So therefore, you want to use, use a logging protocol that uh, can be optimized for writing things out to a replica it doesn't slow you down at runtime. Um, so that way, if there's ever a crash, you're almost never going to have to replay from the log. You just fail over to the, to the replica. So therefore, you, it's better to optimize the system to do runtime operations instead of the, the failure cases. So command logging in VoltDB is a variant of logical logging where the database systems only can record the, 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 the transaction invocation. So like silo and... A VoltDB requires all transactions to be executed as predefined store procedures. So the, thing, the only thing we need to log now is just the name of the store procedure, the input parameters to the function, and then some additional safety checks to make sure things like if someone comes and updates the store procedure uh, and I need to, you know, I, I, I run my transaction, it gets logged last week, then someone comes and updates the store procedure. If I need to replay the log and restore that previous transaction invocation, I want to make sure I use the old version of the store procedure, not the new one. Because right, you want to, again, you always make sure that you always go back to the same state. So another way to think about command logging is essentially transaction logging. You're logging transactions not on an individual query basis, but you're logging them at a high level store procedure invocation. So this is only going to work if we have what is called deterministic concurrency control. So we talked about this when we, we talked about uh, a source concurrency protocol before, um, but I didn't really get into details of like what makes it actually special or different than, the, than these other protocols. And so the unique thing about it is that it can guarantee that if you execute queries, if you execute transactions on the same database state one day, you'll get the same result using the same database state on the next day. All right, in MVCC and these other protocols, there's like a timestamp or a race condition aspect of it where like one thread might come in for another one, right? And that's still correct because you're still maybe generating a serializable schedule, but it may not be the same from one day to the next or one, from running one hardware to the next. So the only way that this actually works is that if we require all the logic in our transactions to be deterministic. 
So what do, what do I mean by that? So say we have a single database with a single record, A equals 100, and I have three transactions, and they're, they're going to execute one after another in serial order. So in this one, it's doing A equals A plus 1, A equals A times 3, A equals A, A minus 5. These are all deterministic, meaning no matter how often I execute these, these, these transactions on this database state, I'm always going to end up with the exact same answer. Right? If I execute it today, I get, I get 298. I execute it tomorrow, I'm going to get 298. A non-deterministic transaction would be if I replace the A equals A times 3, do you need to be A equals A times now, like the current timestamp, then what happens if I execute it today, I'm going to get a different answer than I had tomorrow or yesterday. So this is non-deterministic. So this is, we can't do this. So in the case of VoltDB, for example, they have a bunch of checks to make sure that you can't use timestamps that are, that are generated from the, from, the, from, the, um, from the operating system. It tries to prevent you from using random number generators. Uh, you're, they, don't, they don't allow you to make calls to the outside world. So let's say that your transaction sort of ran for a little bit, and then it made a RPC call to some fraud detection system or something else, right? That could be bad because you run that today, it may give you a different answer tomorrow. Right? So everything has to be sort of encapsulated, in, encapsulated inside the transaction logic and be deterministic. Alright, so I didn't really talk about the, 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 the architecture of VoltDB at the beginning when we talked about the HDR protocol. Uh, but I'll say also up front too, like full disclosure, like when I was in grad school, I was working on the team, we helped build this thing called HDOR, and then they later commercialized it and became VoltDB. So in some ways I'm biased by VoltDB because I helped build it. Uh, but I'll be upfront about where I think the problems are, because it's not, it's good at some things and, and not so good at others. So the basic architecture is that, again, we're going to split our, da our database up into disjoint subsets called partitions that are in memory. And this is the same thing as the partition silo that we saw before in, in, in the silo concurrent control paper. And then each of these um, partitions are going to be assigned a single thread execution engine or a, like a, for a single core that has exclusive access to the data at this partition. And the way the, the concurrent protocol works in HDOR is that it, it uses timestamp ordering to assign timestamps to transactions as they enter the system. And then when, when your timestamp is the smallest timestamp of any transaction in the system, then you're given access to, to the lock and then you can start running. So it, requi it requires you to have, to have all the locks for all the partitions you need before you're allowed to start running anywhere. You have to wait to acquire everything first and then you can go. And just like Silo, again, it's going to be using a store procedure API. So you're going to pass in the name of the store procedure and its input parameters. And these store procedures are essentially these Java class files where you have a bunch of predefined prepared statements. Then you have a run clause where you pass in the input parameters. And then these guys then make invocations to those queries. And again, this logic has to be deterministic. You can't have you know, random number generators inside of this. Everything has to be you know, directly based on the state of the database. All right, so then my transaction starts running. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and write out the, into the command log the, the transaction ID I was assigned, the name of the store procedure I invo invoked, and then input parameters. And then once this is, and I, I write this out before I start running, and once I know that's flush, then I'm allowed to start, I, I can go. And when I finish, I send my result back to the application, and then in the background, we'll take additional snapshots. All right, so in this case here, in command logging, you're writing out to the command log before the transaction actually starts running. And that's different than what we saw in silo and areas because you do it you know, either while the transaction runs or at, at, at when it finishes. So the reason why we can do this before it starts running is because we, we're assigning the, the transaction ID to the transaction before it starts. And we want to get it into the log so that we can document that serial order. So that when we crash, we know what that ordering was and we don't worry about you know, is there some transaction that could have been running while, you know, when, when we crash that may have updated something. So the tricky thing, though, is that if you have to touch multiple partitions, then the, wherever the transaction's home is, wherever the store procedure is running, is considered the base partition. And that's, that's the only place where you actually store this log record. So unlike in, in Silo, where you, if you touched multiple uh, data managed by different, um, different sockets, each of those se socket logger threads had to write an entry about what you modified to its own log device. In the case of command logging, the, the entry for the transaction only appears in one location, and that, that's its base partition. So then we recover, you're going to load the last checkpoint you took from disk, and again, we'll talk about how to do that on Tuesday, and then you're going to just re-execute the transactions in, in the order that they're written out to the log uh, since the last checkpoint. And you're essentially going to be doing the same thing you would do at runtime when you normally executed these transactions. And this is an example where logical logging is slower for recovery because if my 
transaction executed 100 queries, when it ran the first time, I have to execute those 100 queries over again. I'm essentially replaying the, the, the store procedure. The other downside is, because I'm logging, I'm writing the log record out before a transaction starts running, I don't know whether it's actually going to abort or not later on. So unless you store some extra metadata, which in HStore we didn't, I don't know if VoltDB actually does this now, unless you store metadata later on that says, oh yeah, that transaction, you know, one, two, three that you had earlier, it's going to abort so you can skip it again, then you're essentially going to have to re-execute it all over again, even though it's going to abort and, and, and roll back, because there's no extra information in the log that says that this transaction actually never finished. It just, you just see the entry say, go ahead and invoke this. So the one big advantage that VoltDB command logging has over all the other protocols is that it makes it really easy to do replication and strongly consistent replication. So again, we're not going to talk about you know, multi-distributed multi settings in, in this class, but I just want to show you one key idea here that, that, that is actually really interesting that you can only do with command logging. So say that we have our, our application, it sends the transaction request to the master node, and again it says the store procedure and the input parameters. The master will write that out to the command log, but it also forward the same information out to its replica, to the slave. And now, VoltDB uses what's called active-active repli active, active replication, and that means that the transaction invocation is going to be executing at the exact same time on these two different nodes. And then when, th when these, this guy finishes, it just sends back the, uh, it just sends back an OK message to this master to say, yes, I completed this transaction you asked me to do, it came in the right order, and here's the result that I got. And as long as that response matches with what the replicas, the master saw, then it knows that everything is consistent, and then go ahead and immediately send a response back to the transaction and say that I finished. And you don't need to do two-phase commit to say, did you really get this right answer? If yes, and then, and then, you know, then actually do the commit. All you need is one round trip to say, execute this, okay, I did it. And you know that everything is consistent because your transactions are deterministic, meaning if you execute it here and you execute it here in the exact same order, you're gonna get the exact same answer. Right, so you can't do this with physical logging because what would happen is, you would, with physical logging replication is called active passive, and then what would happen is the transaction runs on the master, and then it, it sends the, the log update records over to the, 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 the replicas, and then they apply them. And then you have to do two-phase commit to make sure everyone got all the lo log records they expected to get. Right? So this is one of the big advantages of that, that command logging gets you, um, and it only works if you have uh, to turn a deterministic occurrence control scheme using the sort of the partition-based locking protocol that we saw in HDOR. All right, so what are the downsides of this? The downsides are if you have a transaction that has to touch, touch multiple nodes, again, I don't, I don't want to get into too much details about distributed, distributed databases, but if you have transactions that touch multiple nodes, then if the one of those nodes goes down and all its replicas go down, you basically have to crash the entire system and restart it. Because when you replay the command log, you don't know how to say to the other nodes, you don't actually do this update when I recover. All right, so what do I mean by that? So let's say that we have a simple transaction like this that does a read, read on partition two, and then whether the value is true, it'll update partition two. If the value is false, it'll update partition three. All right, so if, say my transaction is running here. Now if this, if this node goes down and I come back, these guys may be in a state farther in the future because after I executed this transaction, they continue to execute other transactions and updated the state, and then this guy crashes, and now you come back, and this value may be different. So you may be ending up updating, uh, whereas before you maybe updated two, but when you recover, you updated three. Right? And that would be bad because you're, you know, you're updating some kind of counter here. So, in command logging, if this one partition goes down and you don't have any other replicas, you have to knock everything down and then everyone, everyone comes back and you reload from, from your checkpoint. So, in, so under physical logging, you don't have this problem because you know how to restore just this guy on all its changes without having to not notify these other ones. Whereas in command logging, you have to keep everyone in sync. Right? So again, both of you would say you can avoid this by having multiple replicas of, 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 of each partition, each node. So is that sort of clear? All right, so uh, what are the main takeaways from this? So physical logging is used almost everywhere. 
Um, and it's really nice because it's general purpose. Uh, it works pretty much for every, every single concurrent control scheme. Um, and if you use some of the techniques that the silo guys did, it actually is not that, you know, it, it does not become a major sort of bottleneck to prepare these log messages and write them out. But as we saw when we looked at the, that table real quickly, the log is usually going to be much, much bigger than the, the database table because you're, you're basically restoring, you're storing every single update. Logical logging is going to be faster at runtime, but it's not universal. Right? It only works if you have certain, uh, a certain control protocol that, that can support it. As I, as I said, I think it's an open research question about whether you can do logical logging at a sort of SQL level in a um, in an in-memory database system and still you know guarantee correctness and consistent re uh, restarts. But that's again that's a research question that I, I don't know the answer to. All right, so any questions about logging? Yes. Bear out SSD in a little over a year. Mm -hmm. So do commercial um, in-memory databases actually use it for so her question is, um, her question is, in the silo paper, they were writing out log log records pretty fast. Um, uh, right. So you look at this. I, I I forget how long they were they were running this for, uh, but your log is 180 gigabytes. Right. They were basically writing this thing as fast as possible. Right. And at, at this rate, you would burn out the SSDs, and these are really high end SSDs in a year. So her question is, uh, given that you're going to burn out SSDs, uh, do in-memory databases actually use SSDs for logging? Absolutely. The speed difference you, you can get from an SSD versus HDD is so, so much faster that like, your, people are willing to pay the cost of, of having to replace them every so often to get the better performance over a, a spinning disk hard drive. Right? And we'll talk about non-volatile memory later in the lecture, or later in the semester. Uh, I don't have exact numbers, but those reported have uh, uh, longer, longer wear down rates than, or longer wear out than, than SSDs. So you can, you can get the same kind of throughput you can get with this, but you won't burn them out as quickly. There's also different, um, you know, there's different classes of SSDs. Like you can buy the, like the high end enterprise ones that have, uh, that support long wear downs. And then you get, there's like the cheaper consumer grade ones. Yeah, you can burn those out pretty quickly. But again, if you're running an in-memory database that needs to be super fast, you'll pay the money to get, get a real nice device that'll last you longer. Any other questions? All right, so uh, I, as I alluded, um, oh, no, so, as I talked about at the, uh, most in this class, um, for next class, we're gonna talk about doing checkpoints. Uh, so we're talking about different ways you can sort of traverse the database and decide what data to write out during a checkpoint. Uh, we're also talking about a, a, a unique idea or a nifty idea that I like from uh, the Facebook scuba system that allows you to do fast restarts without having to load everything out from, from a, you know, load back in from a checkpoint any single time you need to, you know, refresh the system. Okay? Any questions? All right, so again, keep plucking away at, uh, at your, your skip list. And then we'll, we'll, we'll open up AutoLab with either today or tomorrow with allow you guys to start submitting and testing. Okay? Awesome, guys. See you on Tuesday next week. Enjoy the weather. <laughs>